Welcome everyone to another episode of Dynamics Corner, the podcast where we dive deep into all things Microsoft Dynamics. Whether you're a seasoned expert or just starting your journey into the world of Dynamics 365, this is your place to gain insights, learn new tricks, and hear from industry experts. We have a unique harmonic topic on our plate. We are going to explore the fascinating intersection of music and technology. I'm your host, Chris. And this is Brad. This episode was recorded on July 11th, 2023. Chris, Chris, Chris. Another episode. Another mind-blowing episode. In this episode, we had the opportunity to talk about many topics. We spoke about Business Central, we spoke about music, and we spoke about the Women in Dynamics organization. It, I am fascinated by all of the information that we had learned. With us, we had the opportunity to speak with Soren Alexanderson. Good afternoon. How are you doing? Hey, Soren. Good afternoon. Or good morning. Or good morning. Yes. Wherever <laughs> we are. Good afternoon. Good morning. I go with your afternoon. How are you doing? Doing well, thank you very much. How are you doing? Excellent, excellent. Just not too bad. A new camera set up. Not too so. bad. I see uh, uh, Brad looks like he had uh, uh, frozen a bit. There you go. He's back. <laughs> oh, oh, I have this new camera set up. And as always, you know, you try to do something new right before you do a podcast. So you always have a, a moment of sweat. But we're ready. <laughs> we're here. And, you know, Chris tried to convince me that I need to use the iPhone for the camera versus the other camera. And I went <laughs> That's much testing clearer. and had everything set up. And then when the time comes, as, as always, it's just like doing a demo. When you get ready, you go live. You know, you can test for weeks and test for weeks. And then the minute that you do it, it all goes down. Yep. South, so. but, uh, <laughs> we appreciate you taking the time to speak with us this morning. Uh, as always, we were looking forward to having a conversation with you. A lot of questions uh, to, to talk with you about uh, as far as Business Central's uh, concerned, as far as the product, with some of the things that you uh, have been publishing and posting, as well as some nuances about yourself as well. Uh, I saw her after the conference last year. You, you have some musical talent, so I want to hear about that. But before we get into that conversation, do you think you could take a moment uh, to explain uh, or tell a little bit about yourself? Yes, absolutely. So first of all, thank you for having me on the show. I'm, I'm humbled to be a guest uh, uh, by you guys. Um, so um, yeah, my name is Sword Alexanderson. I'm a, uh, I work as a product manager for Microsoft for the Business Essential engineering team uh, based out of Denmark. And I've been working for Microsoft. Uh, I'm in my eighth year now. So started in 2016, uh, started originally in a in a different position, uh, not in the Business Central team, but actually in the sales organization, uh, thinking I was going to leave the world of ERP behind me uh, completely. Uh, and uh, I had that job in a year and a half. And then uh, in mysterious ways, I ended up in the Business Central team, which which was kind of obvious in a way because I've been working with, with NAF uh, Navision that I makes enemy for many years before joining Microsoft. I just thought that my journey into Microsoft was going to be like drawing a line in the sand, trying a new kind of career. Uh, but like a, like a magnet, uh, I was, I was drawn to the product again. And, and, uh, I'm, I'm so happy I did that because it's, it's just awesome working, uh, working with the team and, and building this product. It is great. It's one thing I had mentioned in a previous episode, a small secret about me is I did leave the channel for about a year. And as much as you think you can leave, it, it pulls you back and it draws you back in. It's a, it gets its grips on you and, and you can't let go because it is a great product. But as the product manager for the engineering team, what is some of your responsibilities with the Business Central mm -hmm. product? Yeah, that's a that's actually a great question because a product manager in Microsoft can be uh, so many different things. Uh, actually, I was until about a year ago, I think uh, the job title was called a program manager, 
And we, I think we figured out as a company that it wasn't completely obvious to the outside world what a program manager does. Uh, I don't know if it helped becoming a product manager, but but a product manager at Microsoft for me is someone who uh, uses his market insights, uh, getting the feedback from the community and from customers and partners, and use that to uh, build a better product, basically to help determine what goes into the product in terms of features and functions. And, and, uh, basically end of the day, if you have to put one sentence on it, it is to delight customers. That's basically what we do. So, so there is a market analytics side of things, getting the constant feedback about what to improve. And then there's the actual delivery of the product, like working with engineers, engineering managers to make sure that the ideas that we can dream up together turn into features that 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 customers love and and also of course partners in the case that we have a very partner driven product uh, which actually are the ones who who take the product to the market right so there's there's always the partner angle as well um which is just super exciting that's good how many members are on the business central team you, you mentioned that there's the engineering team i know there's a number of members on it but uh, as, as the product manager how many members of the business central team are there yeah that, it's a good question unfortunately we go into realm where i cannot disclose numbers uh but but i can say that we are uh, uh more product managers a lot like like myself <laughs> Uh, working on different corners of the product. So you have, for example, a program manager who owns uh, a certain piece of the ap application logic, like for example, finance, have another one who owns, uh, let's say uh, the system layers, so, so to speak. So you have different kind of responsibilities, different owners who own those kind of things. And and then myself who, who own everything related to what we call onboarding, which is uh, cross cutting and cross stack in the sense that it can be stuff in the client. It could be stuff um, that is, you know, enabling APIs for partners that can be features for, for customers. So in my case, I'm a bit uh, horizontal, if you will, or vertical cross the stack. Uh, which is super exciting, which is relatively new for me because until a couple of years ago, I was, I was application only. I'm an old, uh, NAV developer, uh, slash consultant. So I, I came from, from Seaside and that, that side of things. So I never knew what was in the platform or in the client. So that's only in the last few years, I've started learning much more about our entire stack, which is super exciting and comprehensive as. As you know, you've, you've been speaking to, to some of my colleagues, right? And about what's in the compiler, even, I mean, just that one, it's just, it's just amazing all, how all these things play together. That's it is amazing. Cool. <laughs> and through these conversations, I'm learning a lot more about the product, about Microsoft. And I appreciate everybody who speaks with us because it does show to the transparency because before, you know, in working with the application, it always seemed to be sort of the black box where it was just an application and now I see with conversations such as this and as with a few of your other colleagues to really what's behind the building of the application and bringing it to market to make sure that it's a, you know, with listening or you're listening to the feedback or you're listening to what, you know, users and partners are saying about the product. It's something I did not know about you. You were a developer prior, prior, were you, so this was prior to you joining Microsoft, you were a developer. Yeah. So before joining Microsoft, I had a good run of seven years ish where I had my own small, uh, integration company. So this was around the time or the company started around the time where NAV, I think we were in 2009 or two, you know, we had web services, the, the, the soap based web services. So I was basically integrating NAV to whatever on the outside, uh, like, uh, e-commerce systems, uh, shop floor control, you know, whatever have you. So XML and soap was what was my world back, back in the day. Um, and I was also sort of a consultant also, you know, owning or driving, supporting some customers just with regular day-to-day, -day, uh, customizations, reports and that kind of stuff. Um, I, I think it was kind of a hybrid, which 
which I think this community have, have had a, you know, a lot of hybrids in terms of consultants, uh, developers over the years. But as the stack has now, like, there's just so many more things in the stack to know about and the product has evolved that it's, it's hard now to be, I think, both uh, kind of had to, to choose sides, if you will, uh, which is kind of a paradox, even though that we move like with the move to the cloud, there's, there's so many things you don't have to deal with anymore, like, like, like the SQL database and, and stuff, but still, there's just so much more you need to know about if you want to administer a uh, BC, like the uh, admin center APIs or what have you, you know, that's all the API story. You need to know your PowerShell and all these things that a modern uh, uh, developer needs to know about basically where in the past, you just needed to know about Seaside and you could, you could do your business. That is a very <laughs> good point that I have that conversation often. Whereas before, when I first started, you could know the application well, you could know the development well, and you could keep up with it. But now as with the move to the cloud, with the enhancements to the development language and the product, it's very difficult for one person to know everything. Uh, so it's, it's important, I think, as you had mentioned, specialize in a sense, understand, know something, know it well, but also maintain the awareness that something else exists and that resources are available that you can partner with or work with to you know, have a successful implementation for a customer. I think even in the partner space, there's been some shifting to where a lot of partners would compete with each other. And I use that word uh, loosely, where now a lot of partners are partnering together because certain partners can do certain things well, and they both become successful because they have successful implementations for the customer, which is e extremely important. You focus on the onboarding of customers and you, you've had a lot of great content. I've seen some of the webinars that you've put on, uh, on the, the Tuesday Microsoft webinars, uh, office hours as they call them. And uh, also you, you post quite a bit on LinkedIn, which I follow. Can you explain a little bit more about the, what is onboarding of customers? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so, if we go back 10 years, uh, we had NAV on-prem, um, a typical implementation would, would take weeks, if not months, to get a customer up and running, even even a fairly small customer, fairly, uh, let's say, lo low complexity customer in terms of business processes. And But with, with the move to, to the cloud, there's another expectation, uh, and we, we can get it back into different types of customers because we we're, we're serving a very diverse type of customer pool you could say um, but there's an expectation that as you go online and you try out a piece of software uh, even a software even a business application like business central there's an expectation that you can get out get up and running relatively fast at least faster than uh, than the month-long projects that you had back in the old days uh in this world it is like old days even 10 years ago it's old days right um so we wanted to lower the barrier lower the entry bar for getting started and having said that like, like we also fully realize that there are so many different types of customers so in one extreme you have the uh mom and dad's shop down the street, your, uh, I don't know, your bakery or small dentist or whatever, like they just want a system, get up and running, do their taxes. Uh, they just expect that surely there's a template for someone like them. Like nobody wants to do taxes, by the way. Yeah. I just wanted to point that out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> people want to make money, but I don't think anybody wants to pay taxes. No, 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 <laughs> sure. Uh, but surely they, 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 they do expect that they can basically just swipe their credit card, choose their template for their small dentist uh, clinic, get started within the end of the week, basically. That's, that, that's one extreme. Then there's the other extreme on the, on the end of the scale, you have your super complex manufacturing facilities with you know, all the bells and whistles and sewer and upper tracking and all, all that thing. You know, and, and you have tons of customizations because uh, even though BC is sort of a great platform, 
and also as an end-to-end -end business solution, but there's just some stuff you need, you want to have done differently in your, in your company. And for those, like, of course, there's no way that they could just, you know, sign up online, start using the product right away. Like they have to do, you know, specs and, and go through a project where they define their, what are the requirements? And if they're in the medical industry, that's maybe even, even more crazy like this. So, and then there's everything in between those two extremes. What we wanted to address with, with getting, you know, make it easier for customers to get started was uh, more towards the former, like the ones who are uh, lower complexity in terms of uh, business processes where uh, it's very likely that they can use some of the standard setup data and, and so on. So the way we approached it was to try to make tools available for the partners that were in this volume volume game that have maybe identified some templates for their kinds of customers where they can bring all the setup data or maybe 95% of all the setup elements and all the apps that they think this customer will use and provide some great experiences for that customer to easily sign up, go through payment, basically go through the configuration of, of the last mile configuration. And when I say last mile, it also speaks to our onboarding philosophy, which is like, that there are kind of two ways to go. One is drag the customer through all the potential setup options and fields like you would in the old days, a consultant would sit with you and go through a general ledger setup page and say, how do you want that to work? Do you want to flip this field from A to B? Okay, next field and so on, right? That's not the philosophy we have. We have the philosophy that we should default as much as possible, and then the customer can self-serve the last mile setup if they want to change things. So that's what we why we built the welcome banner and checklist system to actually provide that uh, provide a stage for that last mile configuration, um, assuming that a partner will, based on the customer's profile, add the right template, add the right data at the right time, maybe build the chart of accounts based on choices the customer. Uh, you know, based on answers that they choose in in, in some wizard and that kind of thinking, um, and we've actually seen some some nice um, results from this kind of experience. I mean, we've like you've probably seen that on our website. We have we have right now a pilot where we are profiling prospects, and depending on what type of customer they are, what kind of industry, we serve up a a customized trial with with a partner app being loaded. Um, and we see we 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 want to expand that to more partners, of course, and verticals and industries as, as we move along. But what happens there is that a partner's IP is being applied with 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 templates that actually help the customer get up and running. And we actually now see a customer going from that original sign up to running a live production system in nine days, which is kind of cool and kind of a new paradigm uh, for us. And we'd like to encourage that kind of thinking if you have those types of customers, if you serve those types of customers. And of course, we, we're, not try, we're not trying to fit everyone into the same uh, box and say all customers are equal. I mean, because we serve, I think we say that our sweet spot of customers uh, in terms of user size are from 10 to you know 250 customers. But of course, you can have a business central customer that have uh, that has uh, one thousand users. It depends on what they do, and depends on the complexity of the business. So you can have a very large business that is complex, or maybe even simple in terms of business process, and you can have a very small business that is highly complex in terms of business process. So there's not there's not necessarily a correlation between those two things. That's you, you hit a few points, and it's some of the things that. I often question or struggle because the business central product can satisfy businesses from small to large, simple to complex. There's such a wide range of uses for the application with functionality, with configuration, with changes. And now with it being in the cloud, now with customers doing a lot more on their own, you talked about you know, the times of the dinosaurs where a customer would reach out to a partner. I'm looking for a software product. Give me a demo. Show me how it works. Set this up. Let's go through it to 
I will do 90% of the research myself before I even reach out to a partner or somebody, or I want to do it myself and get it set up like you had stated, and then go the last mile with maybe some assistance or some configuration. It's that point right there that I often question, how can we deter customers from making a bad decision because they're not aware of what the product could do or their experience may not be so great and they say, oh, this doesn't work for me. You know, it was kind of discounting it before they actually have the opportunity to work with it. I mean, I, I do support the quick, rapid deployment for those smaller customers, but some of the other customers, like you had stated, how can we, you know, onboard them or take them to a point where they realize, hey, you can do what you need, but not discount the product because you want to go to something else. Yeah, that's a super good point. And that's actually, that, that's probably two sides to that to that uh, thing that you mentioned there. One is in the, let's say, before you buy the product, when you just try it out, if you try, if you sign up for a trial online or, you know, check out some YouTube videos or however you, you meet the product for the first time, like how can, how can we, both Microsoft and you as partners, how can we influence what that experience is going to be uh, so there's there's a chance that you will actually end up buying business central because sometimes it's not it's, and oftentimes it's most of the times i should say it's not just about business central it's about whatever uh, uh industry solution is on top of business central uh, and actually often i think looking back historically and i have i have background with fno the old uh, ax as well often a customer will look to an industry solution first that just so happens to be running on BC or happens to be running on a like a AX back in the day. I think, I think that in that case, many times the, the underlying system is like, whatever that is, 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 is less important as long as it fits with your strategy and you can identify with, with, with the software vendor, it's more important that you have, uh, the right partner fit, the right partner solution and the knowledge to back that up, right? So, but I think, so, and then to your point, how can we then influence both in that pre-sale situation? How can we influence it uh, afterwards? So when you try to onboard, as you say, and it, it's a really, it, it's not an easy task to solve. And I, I can't say that we have nailed it yet because how do you know about certain settings that influence a business process that, you find it to be full of friction, but if you just knew there was a flag, you could flip from A to B, you would be unblocked. Like, so it's, it's always a trade-off between keeping the UI like simple-ish, but still making it discoverable so you can discover things. And there's a trade-off there where, you know, it, it is fairly complex. There's a lot of features, right? So how can we, how can we maybe in the future get better at progressively disclosing some of the things in the product as you grow with it? That's some 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 of the things that we're thinking about. But that's a super hard thing to to crack because we also then probably need to know something about your intentions with the product. Like, what are you going to use it for? You as a user, what is your persona? What do you want to do? Uh, and what is your starting point? What is your what is like, have you worked with the product before? Then maybe you see one type of UI, have you, are you a complete uh, beginner? Then you maybe see another type of UI. So depends on your skill level, like, and we don't know, right? But that's some, those are some of the things that we could potentially in the future ask. And then maybe we could model the UI based on some what logic you, what in you there. expect. I like that idea because the setup checklist, the questionnaire, even if you go back to the early days of NAV, when you first installed it, they used to have the question, what type of business are you? Are you a manufacturer? Are you, you know, other, I forget the questions, but they had a question that would give you some sort of basic template. It is, I had to ask the question because it, it is a big challenge and it is difficult because I think in some cases, some things can be discounted, discounted quickly and you hit another key point. The application is so feature rich that it can scale and grow. So you also want to make sure that customers aren't limited within the application. And now with app source, with partners being able to create applications that are available to customers that they can search for or self serve on their own and then speak with their partners, but then also with the community contributions 
uh, one part of this, which I have mentioned before, and I ask often is now, how can we make sure that with all of these applications and contributions, make sure that the application doesn't get too complicated, right? So we can do a lot of great things with the application. And we mentioned that partners have to work, you know, together or resources have to work together in essence to make sure you can have a well uh, implemented product if you want to branch over, uh, you know, into Power Platform with Business Central and other types. But even within the application itself, how do we make sure we don't add too much to it? Right? You mentioned the A to B switch. How do we make sure we don't have an A to B to C switch, then a D to E switch, and then it makes it, I think, a little bit more difficult to set up or confusing? Yes, and I think there will always be a trade-off because on the other side, we are also trying to nudge partners, uh, definitely ISVs, but also also resellers to, I mean, if you have certain knowledge about an industry, think about how you can uh, put the, take the knowledge of your consultants and put it into some IP, put it into an app. Like, do you need a consultant to ask the customer questions or could you build an assisted setup wizard that would ask those questions and do something? Like, does there really need to be a, a person Sometimes it does because maybe it's just expert knowledge, but sometimes it, it's just a decision thing. Like if you choose A, then you need this. If you choose B, then you need something else. Like uh, we see examples of someone who built uh, an assisted setup who based on some, like there are some questions in the assisted setup and based on the answers, uh, it will populate the chart of accounts based on that. You know, it will download data from a blob storage with some you know, some predefined chunks of the chart of accounts based on some answers and that kind of thinking, you know, populating, uh, Hey, are you going to work with uh, sales return orders? Then you probably want to download these uh, recent codes that is a fit for your industry, like that, that kind of thing. Uh, so instead of just populating all tables with some default data, maybe populate only the ones you need, but again, it goes back to intent. I just want to add a comment about onboarding and why why do we do this? What, like, why do we think it's important? Because I talked about what it is we're doing, but end of the day, we're doing this to help uh, customers get on board faster because they, they expect to, to do that. But we also very much do so for our partners because uh, the feedback we get is that there's such a strain on the industry, there's such a strain on the, on the partner channel in terms of resources that it's about spending every hour wisely. So instead of a consultant spending, let's say, 10 hours with a customer that could maybe be cut in half to five hours if they could apply some app instead that could ask some of the questions so that consultant could free up some time and go serve maybe more difficult customers. That kind of thinking is really what's, what's behind a lot of this. Uh, I can't help but smile it, with this. Yeah. That why is... Perfect. I will play that over and over and over again because you hit on such key points. It's there is a strain in the community for partners, but also you can automate some of these some of the onboarding experience so that every minute spent is efficient. And it also makes it so that from the customer experience, they're also having a quicker, more effective implementation because they can get a lot of the questions and set up out of the way without paying for it. You know, again, you know, from the customer point of view, then it's a, the budget isn't as high. And then when you talk to a resource, it can be for the actual specifics. I don't mean to jump in on you there, but I, I think the experience of having some sort of automated question and answer, similar to a lot of people send out RFPs and the RFPs is like, can you do this? Can you do that? But I think flip it around to the other side. It's just some the of the tedious tasks. Of, you know, let's go through the questions with yourself. I, I didn't mean to yeah. jump in there. No, no, but you, you, you're, you're so right. And, and I will even be uh, a little bit more controversial and say, if you look at this from the customer side, if they have to pay, well, I'm just saying some, some random number now, uh, for three hours to, for their system to be set up so you can, like, let's just say with posting groups so that you can send out an invoice, uh, you know, post an invoice and send it that's not valuable. Like those three hours from the customer perspective, they, they didn't invest in business central to be able to send an invoice, whatever system they had before could send an invoice, right? 
the value is not in getting that set up. The value is getting to the points, to, to the things that like what Business Central can give them. Like the reason for investing in Business Central is a, is a lot of other things than being able to invoice. Like that's just commodity. And that should be as, let's say, as ready out of the box as possible from the customer perspective. So if you if you charge, let's say, tens, hundreds of hours doing that basic setup, you're doing something wrong, in my opinion, uh, unless you have a very super, you know, super complex customer, like you should be able to, to, to template that for that some kind of customer saying, here's all the default data you need, because that's, that's a commodity. But what the, what the customer would like to pay for, what, where the value is, is how do I get this connected to, to the office product? How do I get, you know, how do I get all that surrounding value for, from the product? Um, so I think those who will do this well will figure out, okay, all these things where there's a sweet spot where the customer don't find it, you know, particularly valuable, and we just keep doing it over and over again. We could probably automate that. We could probably build an app or a configuration package or support that via some APIs or whatever we can do to make that a, a one-click thing instead of a, a three-hour task by a by consultant. I think that's a great approach, and I I am happy to hear you say that because then you can do the the you know the old cliche do more with less because your resources as well they're not doing the mundane task of setting up a posting group on the day to day basis they get to work and specialize you know use their skills to help a business become more efficient efficient with the product versus just going through the repetitive task that that anyone could do which is great that it's it's in it's uh like but i said that's I a just perfect smile example because... that's a perfect example because i've been through there in the end user side too where we're going through the implementation and we have our accounting team spend hours and hours just doing the basic setups and you look up and realize hey there's they're still in this space they're still trying to figure out this posting group or posting setup that should have been you know immediately populated on the most basic standards so that they can focus on, you know, what the, the invoice layout looked like, you know, they can focus on things that matters most to them rather than just figuring out the basics. Even dimensions is a perfect example for that, right? <laughs> Coming from yeah. known dimensions and learning from dimensions, they're not going to know you'll have to educate them. And the best way to do that is could be part of the onboarding process um, as well. Could we do a better job of explaining how posting groups work like what are they for in the first place if you come from something like quickbooks where you maybe don't have that kind of you know concept like what's the meaning of posting groups like why do you use them i think we can still do better in some of those cases i also still think that we when we talk about onboarding and, and talk about productivity for for the channel it's not just for the consultants you have things like uh text the ui like uh tool tips, for example, that is still a developer task. We're also very much thinking about how can we bring this into the consultant or product owner realm instead, like even with sort of no code, low code tools, uh, e e even internally in our team, it's a developer who has to write tool tips, whereas it should be someone like me, because I'm the one who, you know, can speak to the value of, of a specific field. Uh, so Soren, you made a you made a comment about having that control not by the tooltip not by a developer but from a functional consultant i think that's a perfect idea because you're as a consultant you're you're with the end user day in and day out as you're uh you may be helping them set up and understand and it'll be nice to be able to like create tooltips specific to their business as you go through the process one of the things that doesn't happen often is documentation so as they're learning uh, their business process or, you know, with the new tool like Business Central, um, a lot of times they forget about the documentation. They don't take the screenshots and things like that. But if you have even a slight assistance via tooltip, uh, teaching uh, end user to look at these tooltips as you hover, uh, I think it's perfect. Uh, I think that's an awesome tool if we as a consultant have that, that, have that option. I, I think you would have idea. to override that. I mean, if you go back to years ago, we had the opportunity to create customized help 
that was an extension of the existing help system. I think if you're talking about the tooltips in that sense, I think there does need to be a baseline set for the tooltips within the application that then somebody could enhance that tooltip to provide better experience for the user or even open up a customized help on a sales order that explains the things that a business would need to do or fill out for their business process. Because yes. there are a lot of fields and there are a lot of pieces of information that aren't relevant for every implementation that, you know, no two businesses are the same. I mean, they, they operate, they have some of the same functions, but as, as Saren had mentioned, each one of them have some unique nuances that they want to be able to capture utilizing an enterprise application such as Business Central. So there's a lot there. The, the onboarding, I'm a fan of the checklist and, you know, the start page, even with the apps, given the ability to, you know, guide somebody through a setup. I think a lot of guided tours, as I will call them, are helpful as long as they're done within some sort of moderation, because there is a point where I think sometimes it can be too much. It's just a matter of how do you balance, you know, the pop up of welcome to the item card so many times uh, for, for somebody to have to click away or get rid of. I know you can get rid of it, but you know, it's the small things, uh, a piece for that. Um, one, one thing as we're talking about the onboarding, I mentioned it before and, and when we were talking earlier last year at the conference, I saw a clip of you and I didn't know that, uh, that you were into to music. <laughs> so if you could tell me a little bit about you and your music. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So I play, uh, I play a guitar in this uh, this rock band, and uh, I've been playing all my life. I, well, since I was 13, 14, uh, so it's it's quite a few years now. Uh, me now being in my in 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 the you know last half of my forties. Um, Yes, yeah, so always, always played music in one way or the other. Sometimes I've had you know a few breaks because my my personal life didn't allow for you know spending the time, and, but I always sort of picked it up again. And um, I moved to uh, I moved to Copenhagen um, some years ago. Uh, moved in with my now wife, and uh, I was looking for looking for a band and 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 found a band. But then during COVID times, uh, we couldn't rehearse. So, uh, and actually, one of the guys from that band was had had an autoimmune uh, uh, illness. So he was really in the risk zone, like high risk zone. So chances were that even though we opened up in society again, that we could rehearse, he was very sort of like he was, he was, he was completely panicking about it, which was totally fair. So I, I had to make a decision at some point and say, you know what, then I probably need to find some other people to play with because I, I won't really want to, you know, uh, do more and, and, and play more. And then, then I found these guys uh, that I play with now uh, by by chance, by by pure coincidence. Of course, I, you know, tried to do some online posts about hey, uh, looking for people to play with. Uh, this is a genre, and uh, you know, preferably be not too far away, and all these things. So, and uh, it turns out there was a there was a perfect match, and uh, yeah, so this is super fun. We play old school hard rock, everything from uh deep purple to uh megadeth to yeah <laughs> deep purple yeah, megadeth uh, i haven't heard any of those names in a long time <laughs> yeah so yeah so, so pr probably a bit more in in, in the old school uh, realm um uh, so that's it, it's sort of in that in that ballpark um no, that's that's great. Product manager by day, rock star by night. I do understand <laughs> why playing some of the older music is you know probably of choice because it was at that time when musical bands had you know individuals playing instruments where it didn't have so much synth synthesis or some you know computer tools. That's great. So you do you actually play you know out at some local establishments as you uh, work? Yeah. With this? So well, since we all have families and jobs and so on, we're we're not the kind of band that. Like, like we could, right? But we're not the kind of band that like would go on tour and that kind of stuff. But you know, we are trying to to find you know maybe five to ten uh, jobs a year. Uh, could be small festival gigs, could be 
uh, in some bar uh, could be private uh, private parties. Like we we have a fiftieth fifth year birthday here in August. We're playing uh, for a few hundred people. Uh, that kind of thing. And, uh, wow, that's so, that's so cool. Yeah, <laughs> that is impressive. That is really impressive. I saw the clip and I was. It, it took a moment because I didn't go to the conference, so I was able to watch from afar by what people were sharing. And I was like, wow, is that uh, Zorin? That's good. I'd have to, um, you don't have a guitar with you, do you? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was just super fun. Uh, playing at the conference, of course, was, uh, was just one of those magical nights because uh, it, I mean, going there to the conference in my capacity as a product manager, Microsoft and doing what I love in, in the daytime and then being able to play with my friends in the evening at the party, uh, showing my colleagues this other side and showing my friends this, you know, professional side. It was just, it was just sort of a perfect, perfect evening. Uh, and, and people seem to seem to like it as well. I think it's great. I, I, we often do forget that we all have other sides of yes. life. You, you know, we work, a lot of us in the community work with each other on these implementations and projects, but it's nice to get to know what other people do for fun, like or what they do outside of uh, Business Central. It is important to have other things, I believe, outside of Business Central, outside of work, as much as it, it seems to be my life these days. It, it is important to have other outlets because I think you can step away from it and become clear. But I don't know if you know, do you have your guitar with you? Yeah, it's always, it's always here. Uh, do you want to, so, do you want to, do you want to play some music? I do have some more <laughs> business central questions for you, but I'm fascinated by your music. How do you feel about playing a little music? I, I don't think I'll, I'll, I'm putting you on the spot. I don't here. think I'll play something right now, but, but I, 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 I do want to mention something that I call, you know, a uh, comment on someone, what you just said, um, so music for me is really where I meditate, so to speak. Like it, 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 it gives me that space where if I don't push all other thoughts out of my mind, I will suck big time at, 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 at playing. So it kind of forces me to, you know, push everything aside and, and now focus on, on playing. Yeah. So, and it's interesting because like there's times where you just want, uh, time for yourself, whether you do things outside the house, but there are moments like I have a uke, I have a ukulele right down below me. And there are times where in between meetings, I just sit back and strum a few, you know, songs here and there just to, you know, prepare mentally to do the next thing that I have to get to. But it's a nice disconnect, uh, even for a short moment. So I love that. It, it, you do bring up a good point. I know myself that how I have my meditation and clearing, which helps me, then it goes with having an outlet outside of work because I do a lot of running and hiking. And if I don't do that, I find my head gets awful congested or, or you know, uh, muddy. Whereas if I go out and I can go running or I go hiking, maybe it's because my body physically gets exerted that it forces myself to, to free my mind and then I can think clearer. And I found that it helps me work with Business Central and the implementations because sometimes things that I've been thinking about or problems that I've been trying to solve, I can go out for a run or a nice hike. And when I'm done, it just comes to me. And I think it's because it just clears everything out of your mind. Like you had mentioned when you listen to and you're focusing on your music and, and playing your music. So it's another aspect of uh, being able to do so. Well, I, I will look forward to seeing some more of your music and maybe one time we'll have you come on where you can do a little, uh, a little, <laughs> a, a little a couple chords for us because I, I'd like to hear yeah. it uh, live. Um, one, one thing you had mentioned, your focus is onboarding of customers, you know, the, the product. What can customers and partners do to help you do that better? Well, what can we do to help you to where you feel you could do better to make sure that the product becomes better? You know, what types of things can we do to help you? The best thing you can do is, is provide information about where you find, where, where you think the friction is. So like for you as a partner, where is it that you spent uh, an unreasonable amount of time 
in projects or implementations that you think could be done differently or maybe just gone away with if we had provided you some tool or uh, did something out of the box. Um, and the same for customers, like we'd really like to, to hear directly from them. And we have this uh, user research panel where we get we can ask some questions directly with customers, but really want to just get as much as information as much information as possible, because that's what end of the day allows us to to take some decision. I mean, I think the worst thing that could happen is if we were in a sort of information vacuum and had to sort of guess, uh, you know, what what should the next thing be. Um, that said, of course, there are things that we can measure in terms of uh, telemetry and usage and stuff like that. But some of the issues with that is that that only shows like you only get telemetry when it gets emitted, right? So you don't, you don't know what you don't know. Uh, so in that sense, uh, the more information we can get about anything related to how to get started with Business Central, the better. And then it's up to someone like me and my peers to say, okay, how to we need to synthesize all this information that we get and and boil it down to okay, but then what should we invest in? And over a period of time now, we've been investing a lot in stuff where we're depending on partners to now go and uptake, like teaching tips, the checklist system, uh, APIs, and what have you. And there's always kind of a long tail effect of that because, I mean, it's been. It's been a couple of years since we did uh, the initial version of, for example, teaching tips and checklist, but we still have a lot of partners that says, oh, we haven't had time to look at it yet. We're so busy serving customers, which is a bit like running beside the bike. You know, at, at some point you need to stop and do the investment so you can go faster. That's, that, that's my favorite analogy uh, because that feels like what partners are doing right now. They're running beside the bike. They can only go so fast. And, uh, but we have done stuff. We have made stuff available for you that you can use to, to, you know, to pick up speed. And, uh, but of course it, it, there is some investment to it. And, uh, again, if you're strained, stopping and doing investment may not seem like the most obvious thing, but I think that's, that's, that, that is one of the ways forward. No, so, it is another key point and it is, there is that challenge from i think from an application and technical point of view with all of these changes you know how to find the time to keep up with it as you said i mean your analogy of running next to the bike is perfect because you're so busy sometimes what you have today that you're not helping yourself help yourself become more efficient and there is a point where you do need to take a step back to say okay if i do this it will be painful for a few moments while I get on that bike and I learn how to ride the bike. But then when I'm riding the bike, I no longer have to run. I can go as fast as the bike and keep up with it. It's from the development point of view, I would use the whole, you know, I, I spoke with a lot of members of the community through the years when we're going transitioning from Cal to AL, there was a gradual transition to bringing all of, you know, the AL language out. You know, you had the BC 14 where you had the hybrid and then the language evolved each after each version. And some never say, well, I don't have time to learn it. I don't have time to look at it. Then all of a sudden a new version comes out and that's the only thing you had to use. And they, some struggled because they tried to jump into it. Similar to what you're saying is now the bike's moving and it's running and now the bike has become a high speed train and you can't run. So you're trying to jump on it and you're constantly, you know, frustrated because you can't jump on it. So that is yeah. a, a good point to yeah, make. Like to, <laughs> uh, it, it is a challenge. I do understand the challenge because you have you know, ultimately from the partner channel, it's to satisfy the customers, but also in one side to satisfy the customers, you also should be current within the application because you can also pass that knowledge on to the customers to teach them how to do it uh, a better way or work with them. I don't even use the word teach them because I've also, exactly. found... say it again. Yeah, no, it's true. It's, oh, no, so, sorry to cut you off there. It's, but it, it is, and also with the customers, the customers are also getting to the point where there's a lot of information available as well. So it is important because they can find the same types of information. So from the partner point of view, it also is important to stay up with it because the customers are also getting the information. I yeah. admire the amount of information that's available today for everybody to have access to, to, to make for a better implementation. 
And I think, I think so I, I mentioned that we've, we've done a lot of stuff in terms of making tools available for partners, how to do better templating and that kind of things and teaching tips and tours and what have you. And, and due to this, I won't say lack of uptake, but because there is this, like it takes, just takes some time for these tools to find their way to partners and they take time to invest in it. I, I think there's more that we can do from the Business Central uh, team to do some more foundational things to improve onboarding uh, where we don't rely on partner uptake, like improving tool tips, uh, making sure that we bridge uh, the documentation with the product in, in, in better ways in the context of your work, things that would just work out of the box. So I think we can kind of foresee, hopefully, uh, without promising anything, of course, that we can raise the quality of this, you know, raise the foundational level of, of some of these, you know, how, if I, if I see the product for the first time, how do I intuitively know where to go to start setting things up? For example, do I know I have to click the settings wheel, go into advanced setup, going to, or advanced setting, going to manual setup, find my inventory setup page to modify costing method, for example, like, how, how would I know that if I haven't, if I don't know what the field is called and what the page is called and where to find the page, all these things that like, so there, there's, there's a lot more stuff we can do. I think where we don't rely on partners just to make it a bit more, uh, friendly and welcoming when you, when you meet the product for the first time, depending on your, on your persona. I, I think that is a good, I think that, and that could also help partners as well with the resources and the constraints of the resources. I do think some of the lag with the partners could be attributed to uh, over the years with the versions with customers and having to work with older versions because customers weren't always so readily willing to upgrade because of what you would have to go through back in the early days. I'm hopeful now where there's been a big push to have Business Central online. I know that on-prem still available, but with Business Central being online and the versions coming out, uh, you know, at a regular interval, it, it almost forces the partner channel as well as the customers to stay current with the application. So you have the benefits of all of the new enhancements to the application and it kind of like I was saying, it could go with your line, keeps you, you know, forces you in a sense to utilize that technology. Because in some cases, if you're working with older versions, you see that the teaching tips come out in the uh, setup checklist uh, type things that you could put into an application for a customer, but you can forget about them because you don't have it readily available to you. So I think uh, some of that uh, will also help drive that. Uh, along with some of the features that you had mentioned with the, uh, you know, UI enhancements to make it more uh, intuitive. Yeah, and let, and let, 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 let's not forget that uh, we, we, we throw many things at you as, as partners. I mean, you have to, like, uh, new capabilities come out in AL and uh, new endpoints in the admin center API and new features you have to explain to customers. And I mean, so th th there's there's plenty of things you have to deal with as partners. So if there is going to be a, a pause for some uh, themes, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. It, it gives you probably, probably some, some time to just breathe for a second and, you know, <laughs> catch up with some of the stuff that, that we added during the last few years. Learn how and to ride a bike. The same... Sorry? Learn how to ride a bike. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then we can also imagine how, how customers feel, right? And that's also the reason why we have two, two larger releases. And we have this thing where you can schedule your, your upgrade of your environment is we we're very mindful of, of the business continuity with, with a customer and you know, introducing change, like even, even just as small as UI change can be seen from the customer as a breaking change in the, in that whatever habit you've, you know, grown used to you, like if we move a button from, you know, from the left side to the right side, now, I don't know, thousands of, of, of people in the world now needs to change their habit because they're used to the button being right there. I mean, so. And it's always a trade-off, even when adding functionality and changing functionality, which is sort of the promise of the cloud, but it's also the curse of the cloud in that sense, because things are changing and that's what you buy into when you 
when you choose a choose a cloud solution. Um, of course, we think it's a good thing that you can always get the latest and greatest, but it it I think it calls for a change of some processes and that constant change management in your in your organization, whether that is at your partner organization or at a customer. Hmm. Yeah, no, I was just, I'm thinking about all of this. And again, you, you, I went into a brief, brief shock for a moment because every time I hear that word breaking change, I just, uh, it goes back with some of the old conversation with Stefan and, and some other individuals in the community. The breaking change is this, like, it's this coined phrase now, I think, that but it, it, within the community, everybody sort of just, it just stops and goes with. Uh, you were also, just to go away from Business Central again, it's not necessarily Business Central, but you're also involved in some other groups and organizations that I see with, with the content that you put, uh, when you, you put out. Can you share a little information on those as well? Yeah. So you're probably referring to uh, my, my uh, participation and engagement in the, in the Women in Dynamics Correct. Uh, organization? Yes. Which, which started as a, let's say, uh, 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 spawned out of directions, uh, direction to Mia, but, but earlier this year became our own uh, organization um, as a not-for-profit. Um, and uh, this is just, I mean, this is super exciting. First of all, I'm, I'm learning a lot from these awesome women um, on, the, on the board. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a board member. And I help sort of drive some of the initiatives and, and, and uh, contribute with 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 with, with uh, you know being a being a male advocate for more females in tech and more 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 women in dynamics. Uh, without going down too far into a rabbit hole about you know numbers and why is this topic important, uh, uh, there there is just a lot of work to do. And um, it's it's a super important topic that can need that that, that needs all the allies and advocates that it can get. Um, and I, I I've I've come to learn that that a lot of the issues we have about the lack of women in tech and lack of women in uh, especially also in dynamics uh, has less and less to do with. Uh, let's say that that the type of people who actively fight against it i think it's much more unconscious bias and culture uh that plays out every day that sort of prevents us from uh seeing where we fall short of of being better allies and you know uh even down to the way that we form uh, job ads you know uh, what kind of language do we use? Do we attract women when we form job ads or do we attract uh, men? Uh, how do companies engage uh, local universities to make sure that, hey, please, you know, try to attract more women? Like it, th th there's a, there's a, I mean, of course, you could, you could argue that, that the issue originates back home in the families where you, uh, if you have a daughter, you paint uh, your daughter's room pink and you paint your little boy's room blue. And do you already then start, uh, you know, uh, uh, probing or sort of uh, uh, feeding, you know, interest into the, you know, a small human being that's only, like, say, one year, two years old? You know, how, how can you more actively also as a parent, so to which I shouldn't really comment because I'm not a parent, but I, I, I can imagine like, how, how can you make girls more interested in tech? Uh, because it's not like males, males are, you know, men are more, uh, you know, from birth more uh, you know, like better at tech. Like it's something that we acquire, it's a skill we acquire and it's, it's an interest that has to be nurtured. So there's a lot of culture going into this, and and we're we're coming at this in women and dynamics from the organizational perspective, uh, really trying to speak to both leadership and uh, and uh, and also the individuals. How when you what can you do? What can you do as an individual to be aware of of the bias that influence you every day? What can you do as a company to make sure that you attract uh, women and also retain women uh, in in better ways, and there's a there's a long <clears throat> there's a long road ahead of us. But I think it it seems like the 
topic has sort of picked up and and uh, gained traction also within within the dynamics community, um, which it has. And I think a lot of it you hit on a number of points with the nature versus nurture type discussions about you know from the early ages of development you know, what thoughts you know inadvertently sometimes you may put into someone's mind or to how they develop but i think a big thing it's the start of anything i think it's raising awareness i mean i think as you had talked about i think just talking with other we've had other conversations and chris and i with some other guests about other topics of a similar nature sometimes people that may combat it you know, there are those that may combat some of these thoughts that they're just blatantly combating it and for whatever reason they have. But then there's others that they're not even aware. It's like you talked about, like if you phrase something a certain way, it's not that you don't want to promote it. It's you're inadvertently suppressing it by the choice of words you have because you're not aware of it. So I think with the women in dynamics, what I've seen from my point of view, and I've been following it and you know, I appreciate what everybody's doing for a number of reasons. Uh, one, uh, you know, personally, I appreciate it. And two, even for the industry, because again, the industry where we're, we are resource tight, if we promote to get more resources in women, men, in any person that's uh, capable of, uh, of working on implementation, it, it helps alleviate some of the resources. But just general awareness sometimes, I think, is a good way to get a movement moving and promoting saying, hey, think of this, or hey, pay attention to that. Like you said, like something so yeah, what, simple as a job ad can turn it around. Yeah, one of the things too, as a father, Soren, uh, you know, I have a daughter and two boys, and you know, what, one of the things that we're doing uh, as parents, my wife and I, is that a anything that's um, tech, right? Because my family is just, that's my industry. I, I'm I previously a director of IT, I love all technology. Not only my kid, my my boys are interested. My daughter, we include her on the things that we're doing, and she's finding or she's sharing creative ways of things that we do as a family. When we have, uh, uh, for example, they're learning how to do Python, and my daughter had different ideas of how she would use the Python language, and so kind of that, like you mentioned about you know, the early stages of nurturing that component, giving them the same opportunity that you would typically do with my boys, my daughters included as well, so that she can understand that tech is not just a dad thing. Like it's not just dad's thing, right? It's the whole family uh, gets involved. So, um, and you, that's, a, I think that's a great point. I, I love what uh, uh, Women in Dynamics stands for. Um, I think it allows uh, young adults like my daughter to be able to look forward to that there's a space for her to be like, hey, I can be involved in that. Um, you know, one of the podcasts we did was Digital Nomad, right? Like she wants to be that, right? Work in tech and be able to just travel at the same time. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's pretty fun. And I, I love what you guys are doing. Yeah, I love what you just said. And I, I love that episode about the digital nomads as well. And I think there's one important point, at least that that's my perspective. I'm, I'm of the opinion that anyone can learn anything. It, it's a matter of putting your mind to it and putting the hours into it. Uh, and then, of course, talent can give you a head start if you have a talent for something. But anyone can learn anything. I, and and we, sh we should really stop having preconceived notions about, uh, you know, girls being better at something or, you know, creative size and boys be better at tech. And so that's, it, it's all a matter of how we how we sort of, you know, feed the interest and how, you know, how we can support. Um, oftentimes, you know, how often haven't you heard, uh, oh, I, I, I ditched that class because I didn't like my teacher M more often than it was because of whatever class. Like, it, you know, often the friction is in, in other things than the uh, whatever field you're working on. It's the experience that you had with it versus the actual topic. Like you, yeah. it's, it's some, it's someone could make the wrong resource could make you have a bad experience, which can turn you away. Whereas if you wrong have a mentor, proper, I was just going to say that if you have a proper <laughs> yeah. mentor to guide you through your process, you can support and embrace something. And I'm with you. I think anybody can do anything. 
if you have interest in it, obviously that's typically where people excel because things that you're interested in, you usually give more to. So it's how yes. do you promote that interest? How do you promote that awareness? Uh, to, to, and I think just in general, you know, you know, women in dynamics is a great cause, but I think even how can we gain interest to have resources come into this community across the board? Um, yeah. And I think, you know, the women in dynamics with what they're doing is a, a, a great uh, opportunity. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to say that there's a, so you, you could of course ask them, but well, what is a, what is a middle-aged white guy doing in, in women in dynamics? Then, you know, is, isn't it all about women going out and, and showing the world what they can do? Yes. But it's also about showing uh, my counterparts, like my male counterparts that, hey, uh, we need to do something. And as we talked about before, the issue, I think, is is very much with the, I call them the passive supporters, like like you, uh, like me. Um, you, you, know, you know, a few years ago, I, I said to myself, well, of course, I support more women uh, in dynamics, more women in tech. But I didn't actively do much. I, I just thought, well, I'm a good person. Of course, I don't judge anyone. You know, everyone are welcome. But that's not enough. Like, you need to take the next step and become active. And that's actually some good tips on how to take some steps in daily life to more actively promote, uh, promote the cause, even in, you know, when you have meetings, uh, when you have conversations, you know, small tips here and there, because, and taking that step from being passive to active. And actually just before this, uh, recording, I just submitted a, a session for directions in Mia with, uh, with a co-presenter where we're going to be two two male presenters talking about all these things, uh, you know, and why it's good for business to, uh, to become more diverse. And that actually doesn't only go for more women, but to your point before Brad, like, like what if we also hire people like actively hire more people with disabilities, you know, they have, and actually I just read an article today about why some disabilities are actually preferred over people who don't have disabilities. And one of the examples were like, there, there was this mall, I think, I can't remember if it was in South America, but they had a mall where um, some of the security people actually were people in uh, wheelchairs that would keep an eye out of, uh, for uh, pickpockets. Why? But because they sit, so they have the line of sight much more in sort of pocket height so they could observe many more pickpockets and they could also chase them down faster because of the wheelchair. And typically people in some of the these people in wheelchairs have much more upper body strength. So when it comes to, you know, fixating and holding thieves down, they would have an advantage over people without that ability, let that uh, disability. So just going to show that goes to show that, you know, different kinds of disabilities can have even positive business impact it, it is it's it's it, it's again it's i hear some of these things and i read a lot of these books and i often even at this point in my life and i try to be rather open-minded in a lot of things to use that word it's i don't even think of it and then he's like oh wow that does make sense and to your support to your point of you know the active support says a lot and again with women in dynamics or you know uh, people in dynamics you know it's all about inclusion uh, for women and others in the community showing the support says a lot for a lot of people as well because then it's it's one it's it's not a, a group of people trying to say hey this is what we can do we can do it and trying to force it through it's also showing that there's acceptance and it's okay for you to do it. We support you. And for others to say, well, you know, Soren, for example, is, is on the board. He supports it. So, hey, I can support it too. Or you just draw awareness to it. And it's it's that active support is just as important as being part of it um, is, is part of the movement as well. And yeah. if, if, do you, the tips, you had mentioned some tips. Uh, do you have those tips readily available? Are those tips available uh, online somewhere that somebody could take a look at to yeah. uh, better yeah. embrace? Yeah, so some of them I'll be I'll be talking about in this session in, at uh, at uh, Directions Mia if it's going to be approved, of course. Uh, and just to I just want to call out that this is not a session where me and my co-presenter, uh, you know, it, it's not like we're not the experts. Uh, this is very much uh, 
session where we will reflect over our own shortcomings and how we sort of failed through the years and how we could, you know, how we've learned to become more active. So it's, it's, it's not a session where you come to get shamed uh, as, a, as a man. We hope a lot of men will come so we can learn together and learn about, you know, hey, what, what can we do? But I want to mention, I want to call this, uh, this book here, uh, a book for guys, uh, women in tech, a book for guys. Um, what it does, it, it basically outlines seven male prototypes, like on, on the lowest end of the scale, you have the active demoter, the active, you know, one who fights against more women than you, when, you know, the chauvinistic uh, type of person. And then on, on top of the ladder, you have the very active promoter that just really does a lot to, uh, encourage and, 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 and actively, uh, is actually a contributor in terms of retaining uh, more women in, in tech and so on. And then you have everyone in between. And the, the interesting thing with this book is you, you can find yourself as one of these, or maybe a mix of some of these archetypes. And then there are some very useful tips for each of them to say, okay, if you were this archetype, uh, this prototype of, 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 a, of a male in terms of an advocate or ally, this is how you can, with some easy steps, take the next step up the ladder and become more active. So it's a lot of practical tips and very, very useful. I highly recommend it. No, I'll put that on my list. I do a lot of reading now, so I have a few more in front of that, but I will put that one on my list for certain. Uh, I appreciate awesome. you sharing it's on my that list. with us. It's my, on my list as well. No, it's, it's, I didn't even know about that book. And we'll put that in the show notes as well, too, because I think stuff like that is important. Again, to me, it's all about awareness. Individuals can make their own decisions after that, but at least offering the opportunity to have somebody be aware of something you know, at that point, it's then up to them to make the conscious decision on where they want to go with it. But uh, I'm a big advocate for uh, inclusion all around, and I appreciate it. What can, you know, partners do? You know, we talk about women in dynamics, mentoring uh, dynamics. What can partners do to do more to support women in dynamics? Uh, and what information do they have available mm -hmm. to help, you know, promote women in dynamics within their organizations? So there, at this point, there, there, there are a couple of things you can do as a partner. One is you can, um, you can sign up to become a member. It's on the womenindynamics.org website. You can sign up to become a member. And what that means is basically that uh, we show your company logo on the website. Uh, and, in, and in return, you have to share, I believe, once a year, your diversity numbers, like uh, you know, how, many, how many females, how many male that kind of information. So we can get an overview of the situation and, and, you know, what's, what's the, what's the current state of the union in terms of diversity in the uh, dynamics community. So that's sort of the basic thing. Uh, I hope everyone will do. And, and a lot of, and a lot of companies have done, like we have hundreds of companies signed up, uh, signed the pledge, we call it. Then, um, there's, uh, what you can do in your businesses, of course, there's a framework on our website. That, that kind of describes how would you actively go about implementing some 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 changes in the company, but in terms of more supporting the organization, uh, women in dynamics, you can uh, you can become a sponsor, and there are sponsorships at at two levels. There are sponsorships uh, at at sort of a conference level. So, for example, we're going to Directions EMEA, hopefully, right and and. Uh, you can sponsor our participation there, which will help us as an offer profit to, you know, pay for plane tickets, uh, merchandise and that kind of thing. And then there's also the opportunity to become a strategic sponsor, which we will promote uh, much more, which is more you know, not for the individual conference, but for, you know, over time being a strategic sponsor, uh, you know, front page on our, on our website and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of things we, we do there to sort of call out you know, and, and I can't remember the numbers, you know, how, how much the cost is to be to these sponsorship levels, but that's, that's what you could do. And, and we are a not-for-profit. I mean, all, all of the stuff goes to you know, create more awareness basically. And, and with us becoming a organization on its own, it helps us participate uh, in more conferences. So we were also part of the Dynamics Minds conference in Slovenia, uh, Directions NA, uh, and we do see, you know, foresee that we would, you know, uh, increase that participation in, in, in other conferences as well. So that's excellent. There's a number of opportunities for partners to have varying levels of support for, for the organization, which is great. What about yeah. 
individuals that would like to contribute on an individual basis? Is there anything that someone can do to contribute individually, volunteer, you know, participate in any events or any promotions? Yeah, I think uh, at least when it comes to sort of conference season, uh, I think when 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 we plan for conferences, or let's say, or rather, when when we execute, uh, we 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 can need people to just do some practical stuff. You know, uh, uh, someone carry the T-shirts with the logos. You know, like there there, there are different things that you can do. Um, what you can do in daily life, I think, is is just help spread the word. Like, would we post something on LinkedIn or Twitter? Just help you know amplify that that presence of these posts in your own networks. I think that's that that, that would be great. Uh, we see a great uptake in followers on our LinkedIn page, uh, and the more we can spread the word, because we also that that is currently that is our channel where we sort of boost the message and 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 highlight these the, these great great women in in the community as role models. So uh, and also if 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 there are females out there that want to become role models and have sort of a showcase on hey what do they do because it's all about telling the good stories like telling stories. So we can nurture people out there who haven't yet ventured into tech or into the dynamic community so that they can learn, oh, there's probably a job for me in tech. And, uh, and even if I'm not technical, maybe there's a, maybe there's a marketing position. Like there's, there's all these, uh, like ways to get into the community, but of course we do want us, you know, people to aspire to also become, I mean, people to have technical careers in the community as well. Yeah, so. Great. So there's a number of options available for individuals as well, which is great. I, I think it's a great, uh, a great group, and I'm happy to see that your own organization. Now, I did, you know, stop by and talk with everybody down at Directions NA, which I, I think was surprising. I think they were even surprised when they had the event at how many people from the conference showed up, which was great. Uh, in, in some cases, it was, you know, standing room only, in a sense, because, you know, they had the luncheon and there wasn't enough room, which to me was it was impressive and it wasn't there wasn't enough room like they didn't plan because they had plenty of room it was impressive because of all of the people that went to show the support so i'm happy to see that within the community well so yeah. thank you for taking the time to speak with us today i could talk with you all afternoon all evening but i know your, your time's valuable and uh i know you probably uh, have a lot to do as well but how can somebody get in touch with you or, or contact you or to see some of the other great things that you have uh, going on and learn a little bit more about Business Central onboarding, Business Central, your wonderful music and women in dynamics. So I think the easiest way for people to get in touch at the moment will be through my LinkedIn profile. Uh, feel free to just uh, send me a message there or through my, um, through my Twitter profile um, as well. And, uh, I'm happy to hear from anyone uh, with, with, you know, it could be related to women dynamics, to business central, to music or whatever. Actually, funnily enough, the last week I've had three different, uh, three emails from three different people about career advice of how to get into tech, maybe taking a more, uh, uh, you know, deliberate action to leave an accountant job to get more into the technical side or, uh, one person who asked about, Hey, how, what was it like to be hired in Microsoft? And she saw some open positions. What should she do? And so that was, yeah, I, I'm happy to help in, in whatever way. Uh, so yeah, please just reach out. We'll put that information in the show notes and you, you, you keep hitting on these topics that I feel are just always at the forefront of my we mind. We have to bring you back. We have to have <laughs> you back because you just, maybe just, I'm getting older. But you mentioned, how do I get a career in tech? It's, we, we spend a lot of time, and, and Chris will know where I'm going with this because we spoke about this the other day and haven't released it yet. It's, we talk about getting people into tech and we assume that a time, oftentimes it's taking the resources out of college, out of schools. But what about those that are a little bit older and want to have a career change. This this has to be a topic. We have to try to try to get a several <laughs> individuals in to talk about just how to promote career change for those that may have worked in a particular industry for most of their career, but now they want to branch over because they have an interest in something else. Uh, so 
even in the women in tech, like you said, is cross bringing over. Let's bring women into tech from finance or women to tech from another industry to show yeah. the sport. How do we do that? So it's a super interesting topic and there's a lot to be said about that. And yeah, so that, yeah, I, I'm happy to participate in that kind of talk. If you ever do a, no, yeah, I will, well, <laughs> I will, we'll definitely stay in touch. Uh, I try to stay in touch with everybody often, but that is something that I would like to speak about because I think that could help the business central community but it also can help women in dynamics, but it can also just help people, right? That's, that's ultimately yeah. what I look at is I, I try to do something where uh, somebody can get something, you know, out of what we talk about or just be enlightened to have some awareness of a topic, but that, you know, not that I'm looking for a career change, but. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe but work I, at I Microsoft. Think... <laughs> yeah. So, so, so before we leave, I want to just say thank you to you guys. Um, I think you do in, incredibly important work with with shows like this uh we see them popping up i see steve endo has something i see uh uh to be as fenster has his podcast and the, i mean it's it's just awesome to have a community uh within the channel with the kind of passion that you have and it's just i think you you impact and and, and influence a lot more people than than you maybe know so uh uh, thank you so much for doing that. And thank you for having me on the show. No, thank you oh, for those thank words. Thank you for the words. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you for those words. And also thank you for participating because we wouldn't be able to do this without, you know, having such a strong community and strong community members such as yourself that want to speak with us about this. So I think it's, it's a whole big ecosystem where we speak about. And Steve did uh, have a good podcast release this morning that I want to go check out, uh, listen to after this. But uh, thank you again. We uh, appreciate your time and we look to talk with you soon. Thank you, Chris, for your time for another episode of In the Dynamics Corner Chair. And thank you to our guests for participating. Thank you, Brad, for your time. It is a wonderful episode of Dynamics Corner Chair. I would also like to thank our guests for jo joining us. Thank you for all of our listeners tuning in as well. You can find Brad at developerlife.com. That is D V L P R L I F E.com. And you can interact with them via Twitter, D V L P R L I F E. You can also find me at Matalino.io, M A T A L I N O.io. And my Twitter handle is Matalino16. And see, you can see those links down below in their show notes. Again, thank you, everyone. Thank you and take care.